Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 48 Black presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Christina Noble, and I'll be your host this evening. I am also the current project manager of Stories of Atlantic City. I am so happy to be a part of this amazing event. I know there's been so many phenomenal presentations going for us this weekend. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to present twice. Yesterday, we had an interactive um, kid-focused program about story storytelling, excuse me. And now we get to spend our time with you. Although the format is a little different this year due to the pandemic, we are still so happy to be able to connect with you. We also have on the call with us Toby Rosenthal, who is the Stories of Atlantic City Project um, Coordinator. We have Lucaya Taylor, who was a current Stockton student and intern for Stories of Atlantic City. And we have Nastasia Davis and Elena Gonzalez, who are both currently involved in some of our recent projects and initiatives. You'll be hearing from them shortly. Today, we'll be talking about the story behind Stories of Atlantic City. We've realized that the project may be new to some of you, but by the end of this event, event, we are hoping that not only do you understand who we are and what we do, but that you're eager to get involved. We hope our time today together flows like a story. As we focus on our setting of Atlantic City, we look forward to hearing from some very strong characters involved in our project. Let the great work of these individuals and initiatives serve as our story arc. And at the close, it's our hope that our story will be continued through you. Now let's turn the page to Toby, who will give us a brief overview on what exactly Stories of Atlantic City is, how the project began, and what it's morphed into today. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the background in this story, which is the story of Stories of AC. Almost two years ago, in September 2018, about two dozen community members and journalists gathered at the Carnegie Center to learn about restorative narrative and how this kind of approach to storytelling could strengthen our community. What is restorative narrative? It is an approach to media making. It refers to journalism and storytelling that tells deeper stories of people and communities experiencing adversity. And this kind of storytelling taps into their strength and resilience to cope and grow. These stories can inspire audiences who see renewed potential for their own lives and communities, and we hope to change perspectives by showing commonalities across differences. The first year of Stories of Atlantic City, which was back in 2018, fo focused on a strong alliance with our media partners in the community. However, we know the media ecosystem and landscape keeps changing and evolving. So Stories of Atlantic City also has changed and evolved in the times as well. For this year, we are focused on community powered storytelling. We want to work more with the community to give tools to, to tell our own stories. Uh, we had our first uh, community vision event that was scheduled for early March. Um, and the date of that event also coincided with everything starting to shut down in response to the pandemic. Um, so we moved all of our programming online. Uh, you may have joined us or seen some information about our virtual story circles and other efforts that we had put forward. Another significant way that we grew for this go around was that we added our project manager, who is Christina Noble, who you've all met today. Um, so we are so excited to continue to grow and evolve. Um, and in these recent times, as we're going to talk about today, um, you're going to hear some of the shifts that we've had to make. And I'm going to toss it back to Christina, who will take over the this story and share with you about one of our uh, next uh, connecting efforts during these times about our phone tree. Thank you, Toby. So as mentioned earlier by Toby, um, like so many other organizations and businesses, Stories of Atlantic City was forced into a new virtual space upon the onset of the pandemic. Um, upon witnessing the wonderful community response to the outreach and information sharing we were doing, the Dodge Foundation provided a COVID-19 rapid relief fund grant. Although we were reaching some, we realized early on that we were still missing um, a huge portion of the population. And we figured this was due to a digital divide um, or for some reason, people being isolated. A partner of ours mentioned a Rona phone tree model that his organization and others were implementing in different communities. 
the model was designed to be a two-way information gathering tool and it was working. Our community immediately responded and said they also thought that this could work in Atlantic City. So we thought that this could be a perfect way to utilize the rapid relief grants and get immediate funds into the community members who may have need, who may need it um, and who may have been affected by the pandemic financially. Our vision for this model included partnering with local organizations that would hire callers to reach within their networks and make these calls. Call captains would also be brought on by each organization and would essentially serve as liaisons between the callers, organization leaders, and the SOAC team and help with managing and supporting where needed. As we were finalizing our caller questions about COVID-19, we were first facing the next community challenge, responding to the senseless death linked to police brutality and racism. We added a few new questions to our survey in an attempt to make it more comprehensive and relevant, and relevant to the current events taking place. We've included questions about the social change that's happening as well as the upcoming elections in November. Presently, we are partnering with organizations such as the ACRs Foundation, the Hispanic Alliance of Atlantic County, and Mud Girls. It's our hope that this phone tree template will evolve and be used as an ongoing tool within our community to gather and disseminate information where needed. We are grateful for the support of our community organizations and callers who are serving as conduits into these neighborhoods. We've even had a number of individuals volunteer their personal time to serve as callers. The outpouring of support has been amazing. So today we have one of our lovely phone tree callers on the line, and that's Nastasia, and I see her somewhere. <laughs> um, she was born and by, supported by the AC Arts Foundation. Many of you may know her. I know she actually just hosted an event of her own prior to ours. Um, so let me pull her up. I'm going to stop my screen share for a moment just so I can see her lovely face. <laughs> Hi, Nastasia. How are you? Oh, we can't hear you. Hold on. I, all right. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Hello. Hi, How are welcome. you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm of excited course. about this project. And um, it's been, you know, um, a learning experience as I've been trying to get used to, you know, the um, questions that I ask the caller, the interviewees and um, so on. So thank you so much for having me. Thank um, you for being here. Um, so I believe we may be having a car recipient on the line. Do you know if she was able to make it today? I, I've sent her the uh, Zoom invite that I was, that, that, that came to me and um, I'm hoping that she is able to call in. But if she is not able to call in, um, you know, I will do my best to answer everything, you know, from my perspective. Um, no problem. Okay, so then that's absolutely fine. We'll just go ahead and get started. Um, okay. So first, can you tell everyone a little about yourself, your connection to the AC community, um, your affiliation? Okay, sure. Um, I am a visual artist and photographer, um, and as and also an educator. I work in well. I worked in the Atlantic City Board of Education. Uh, district as a parent educator and mentor um, for the Parent Resource Center. So I have a lot of connections um, and I'm able to reach out and speak to a lot of the students that are in the area um, and parents as well. Um, I, aside from creating my own um, visual conceptual artworks, I do a lot of like self-portrait work. Um, Prior to this event, I had a brief little art conception video of um, some artwork that I that I've just recently done over the pandemic. Um, but aside from that, I do um, I teach photography. I and I usually do that through um, the Coalition for a Safe Community. Uh, we didn't get to do anything this summer because of the pandemic, um, but usually that is. Um, an organization that I work with um, teaching photography to city students either through PAL, um, the Police Athletic League, um, or Stockton um, Arts Garage. So um, I do that as well and it's, um, I love this uh, the city. I've, I grew up in this city. Um, you know, I, I went to elementary school here, 
uh, Uptown School Complex, uh, then Atlantic City High School. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 I also go to church in this uh, community as well, St. Augustine's Church. And I just love, you know, my community and um, all the wonderful artists and, and people that I, I um, connect with on a daily basis. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you for that, Michelle. I know yes. you probably gave um, a little info about yourself prior to this your event, but thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. Um, so you're one of our pioneer callers, so to speak, um, yes. as this is a fairly new initiative for Stories of Atlantic City. So yeah. what made you want to become involved with this phone tree? Okay. Well, uh, prior to the lockdown, I worked with Stockton University in Res Life. And, um, you know, as with many places, um, you know, we, you know, I, I wasn't considered an essential worker. Um, so I was let go, um, and I'm actually still in that situation right now. So um, with that being said, I had a lot of free time, and I wanted to get involved with some projects to keep me busy in the community. And uh, I heard about Stories of Atlantic City through you, Christina, and it just sounded like something that would be up my alley as far as what I would be into. I, I love... Um, hearing especially stories um, from the elderly about, you know, just, you know, how they view things because they always have a really unique way of, you know, exp um, you know, telling their side of, oh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm on the porch. <laughs> the bird sounds lovely. It's okay. I'm <laughs> Sounds very calming. Yeah, he came right up toward me like, oh, shoot. So, so, so I, <laughs> I apologize. Um, so I was interested. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, You're fine. You're absolutely fine. <laughs> that, Maybe that, that was, was a sign. Really, yeah, that was shocking. I've never seen it coming straight for my head. I might have to go inside. Um, no. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, all right. No, that I wasn't expecting, so, okay. Um, I just wanted to be a part of Stories of Atlantic City because I needed um, something to be, you know, to keep myself busy and to have something to do um, while I was, you know, out looking for, um, you know, work. So, um, and aside from that, I just love, you know, storytelling. I love listening to people's, uh, you know, their stories on their life. And, you know, I, 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 I'm really intrigued with that um, type of um, interaction. So that was my initial idea of what I thought it was about. And that's why I thought, okay, so I, I'm going to just give this a try. Awesome. Yeah, I know okay. you kind of fell right in line there because you're an artist yourself, Am. Yeah. The reasons I'm so happy that you did decide to um to come on board <laughs> is mm -hmm. because I know that you're so heavily involved in the community. Um, I've been to quite a few events, including the protest mm -hmm. and um, the cleanup yeah. in the city, and I run into you each time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think you are a perfect candidate for something like this. So once again, thank you. Yes. Um, what's the general response that you've received from from call recipients? Okay, so the general response I've gotten, people are a little, um, okay, so I'm calling people that I know. So they're comfortable talking to me, but um, they often ask, is this something that would, you know, like they would not feel comfortable getting phone calls from, because it's kind of like they're thinking of it, like, you know how t like a telemarketer may <laughs> call and you know get information from you it, it, it kind of like puts them aback or kind of like you know makes them feel like uneasy to answer questions um they were a little bit more comfortable just you know as far as just like giving me feedback for how i can you know improve they just um suggested that perhaps, um, you know, if we sent out a letter to, you know, people in the community explaining um, what it is or some type of mailing or a postcard, 
um, you know, and, and then maybe providing like a number that they can call back and, you know, you know, give their, um, their, you know, resources and, and, and different things, um, you know, about that, like that would be something that they feel would be a easier um, way to gather information because um, a lot of times if you're, if we're doing like cold calls, you know, you know, if, if you just call them, you know, you know, just say, oh, okay, I'm going to call Susie at six o'clock tonight and, you know, just start to ask some of the questions. Um, you know, they may be, you know, doing something with family or however. And, um, you know, that was just one of the um, feedbacks that I got from one of the callers that I spoke with. But, um, you know, thankfully, I was able to, you know, get a few calls and um, I got really good uh, feedback from, you know, the people that I were was able to interview. Um, a, a lot of them actually have access to, you know, reaching out to whoever they need to call for problems that may be in the city, you know, um, you know, say like reaching out to their councilman or something like that, you know, they'll be, a, you know, they're pretty much um, aware of who that might be. And uh, they know how to reach out to that person. Um, um, but other than that, it's, um, it's still something that um, I want to continue to give it a try and just see, you know, what, like, what other kind of responses I could get, um, you know, as I continue to make these calls, because I, I think it's really important that we're constantly, um, you know, just, just, you know, connecting ourselves with the community and, and finding out information from them, um, you know, whether it be through a newspaper or, uh, you know, um, email, something like that. So I, I, I think, I hope I'm answering the, quest, the yeah, question correctly. You are. <laughs> so, yeah, no, okay. I think you made a lot of valid points, um, mm -hmm. especially in regards to making cold calls. I think that's why it was so essential for us to have these people that were already deep rooted in the community to make right. it because it makes it a little more credible. Um, right. So that's definitely some valuable feedback. Right. And we are working on some ways. Um, other ways in which we can disseminate information because we know we do have a very demographic in Atlantic City. Um, mm -hmm. We do have a lot of older people who may have accessibility issues due to not having technology, um, or whatever the case it may be. I know some of them prefer, a lot of them prefer, even I prefer <laughs> um, mm -hmm. reading things on a paper still, you know, right. so we are exploring mm -hmm. some of those options um, for our future. Mm -hmm. um, so do you find this model to be valuable and why and why not? Um, I think it is valuable. I think that, um, you know, the initial calls that you do to people, um, is, 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 is a great way to get information. Um, you know, one of the callers that I spoke to today, actually, she told me that she would be like more comfortable if I came to her home, um, and interviewed her. I would just have to have a mask on. Um, but she just felt like the phone, I, I guess, for whatever reason, maybe she just felt more comfortable, you know, having a, you know, one-on-one -on -one person to person interaction as opposed to on the telephone. So um, that was one specific response that I did get back from um, one of my uh, people that I made a, a call to today. Um, but I do think that this is great. I love the format and how, um, you know, we have a digital format where the questions are there and you can kind of go off, like you don't have to say the questions exactly verbatim, but you can, you know, kind of just, you know, use that as a guideline and, um, you know, give the answers to, you know, the interview and just put it in to each question. And I really like how, um, I, I like I like how it's digitally. Um, I, I like how the format is is digital. If I'm making yes. sense there, but <laughs> yes, yes, no, you are. Um, okay. Great. So, last question for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you share? Can you recall a brief story of resilience that was collected on one of your calls? Uh, yes. Community or something during the pandemic. 
Um, just mm -hmm. something that really stuck out in your mind. Okay, yeah, there is um, s um, someone that I did speak to who is going through a severe case of uh, depression. And he has been, um, you know, fighting this for quite a while. And um, I think with the pandemic happening, it's kind of like slowed everybody down. It's slowed everything down. And it's kind of, you know, we've been, it's terrible that, you know, the coronavirus has, um, you know, come upon us, you know, uh, you know, in our community across the nation and, you know, globally. Um, but there's almost kind of like an upside to that. If I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that exactly, you know, but it's like a downside. It's like, you know, it, the, the positive part about it is that we were able to um, be still for a little while and just recollect our thoughts and just think about, um, you know, our situations and, you know, whatever issues we may be dealing with or troubles we may be, you know, be it personally or professionally. And, um, you know, during this time, we were able to um, kind of slow down a bit. And uh, he was just explaining to me how, you know, with that being, you know, with that happening, he was able to just, um, connect back um with his uh he has he has these uh classes that he goes to um and it's um through a resource uh behavioral cross crossroads and they deal with a lot of um um depression and substance abuse um you know patients and things so this um you know, resources really helped him to kind of like bounce back and, 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 and be, you know, kind of like step back, but, you know, you know, kind of give him a chance to reflect on, you know, his personal issues, but, you know, a lot of resources that have come through that he's, he's been able to like recover and, you know, kind of feel like himself again and, and, um, you know, just, feel like he belongs and, you know, that he is, um, you know, just recovered from that. So it's, um, I think that was probably one of the most resilience. I mean, um, I, I think that would be probably one of the, the, the more like prominent stories in my mind that I can recall or think of um, with that. And thankfully because of, um, you know, we have so many different um, resources in, in the community that can help anybody if they're going through anything, um, you know, and that's one of the things that I liked about um, the list that we got, because um, there's like several um, resources and links that people who are in need of anything, you know, to help them, they can look at these links and, and you know, be connected and not feel like they're all alone and going through these things by themselves. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I think that was probably the most, um, you know, the most, the, 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 the most prominent experience in my mind that I can think of. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the resource list. So mm -hmm. we, at the Story, Stories of Atlantic City team, we compiled a list of resources for our callers to utilize um, in the case that someone had an urgent need. Um, so they had that readily accessible to grab it and give it to that um, recipient in case they needed it. So I'm glad to see that you were able to utilize that. Um, and that was such a wonderful story of resilience. I'm sure so many of us can connect to that story, even though we have mm -hmm. experienced so many things on the downside or negative um, experiences, or just ex experiences of change altogether. There still have been a lot of great moments. I mean, at least I can speak for myself personally, um, mm -hmm. of just like a recentering or a reconnecting. Um, mm -hmm. So that's awesome. That's so wonderful. Yes. That was my last question for you, Nastasia. I want okay. to thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. We truly do. It's a privilege to have you on board with us. Um, we're excited to hear some more of the stories that you gathered on these calls. And yes. we, look, we look forward to continue to collaborate with you. So thank, thank you, you so much. Stay thank safe. You. Don't get too close to those birds. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize again for that. That was You're totally out of my, I, if I could show you all what I was looking at. <laughs> you are Thank absolutely you. fine. 
Thank you so much, Miss Sophia. Thank you. Okay. Everyone have a good day. Right. Bye bye. So we hope that these testimonials inspire others to get involved. Um, some ways in which you can participate include becoming a caller or providing information for someone you know who could benefit from a call like this. You can find more information on our website. I believe Toby dropped that in our chat already. Um, all right, so now we are going to turn the page and I'm going to share my screen again to talk about another project um, that we have going on. I think I'm having, okay, here we go. So this is where I'd like to bring in two of our other people on the call today. So they're going to talk about this initiative um, just as a prelude. As we all know, we're living in an extraordinary time. Many of our lives are forever changing, and it all started a few months ago, back with the onset of COVID-19. We knew that at that time, we'd be witnessing and experiencing a historical moment. Because this was the case, we at Stories of Atlantic City thought it would be beneficial to chronicle these real life events through an Atlantic City lens. We currently have two ways in which we're doing this. Um, I'll talk to you a little later in the program about one of the ways. However, at this time, I'd like to talk about a multi-part series that we've recently published on our website entitled Invisible Youth, excuse me. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Lucaya Taylor and Elena Gonzalez into the conversation. They'll be sharing a bit about themselves and their contributions to highlighting AC experiences amid the pandemic. So I'll start with you, Lucaya. Hello, Lucaya. Hello, Christina. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. 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 Thank you for joining us. Oh, um, yes. Good. So can you start just by telling um, us a little bit about yourself and your connection to the AC community? Of course. Um, so I was born and raised in Atlantic City. Uh, very similar to um, our last guest. Like she, um, I volunteered at Atlantic City's Police Athletic League. I went to school to um, Oceanside Charter School until seventh grade. And I've been to the beach like more times than I can count. <laughs> Um, my family and I will be moving to Galway soon, but uh, through my scholarship, I'm going to be able to stay on the Atlantic City campus. I'm, I'm just not ready to leave Atlantic City yet. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Good. Thank you for that. Um, why did you find significance in focusing on this particular demographic? And I know you're going to talk a little more, a little more about what this actual pro the project is, um, so you can put that in context a little better. Um, so let's backtrack a little bit. Could you just tell us a little bit about your project in depth? Okay, well, Invisible Youth started as a collaborative effort between uh, me and the Stories of Lang City. Um, my internship with them was facilitated through a summer class that I'm taking at Stockton University currently called uh, Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement. So it was through Stories of Atlantic City and uh, my professor, Dr. Tomei's support that I was able to interview some of my peers about their experience during COVID-19. So that way I could then publish their stories in a sort of magazine blog style type article. Uh, my goal with Invisible Youth was to be able to formally document their experiences while also connecting with each other, like in order to process like everything happening during this like unprecedented time. Thank you. Now I can fast forward. <laughs> Why did you find significance in focusing on this particular demographic, or in particular the Gen Z students, um, for this project? Uh, for this project, I was very fortunate uh, to be supported by both Toby Rosenthal and Erin O'Hanlon. Uh, they, when approaching me about this project uh, for my summer internship, they mentioned how the general conversation around COVID-19 uh, largely left out college age youth. So that sort of inspired me to create a project um, that highlights our experiences, especially uh, my age group. And in letting their stories like take center stage, I feel like we got to connect while also contributing to the larger conversation at hand. Awesome, yeah, and I do agree. I know um, the onset of the pandemic, most of the news that we heard about was about the elderly community um, or these people that were at risk, but we weren't really focusing on this generation, like you mentioned. Um, so I love the work that you're doing, and hopefully our audience members can at some point go and check out your story. Um, so yes, did you find any trends or common themes throughout your interviews? 
uh, throughout our interviews, like um, even though every participant had a story of hardship to share during this time, they all also had an optimistic view of the future. It's mm. like um, they all realized in their own individual ways that there's no use in like fearing the future instead of like embracing it. Like, of course, we still feel cheated out of the summer that we were supposed to have, but we know that summers will continue like they used to uh, eventually. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to shift my focus over to Elena for a bit. Um, hello, Elena. Hello, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Of course. Could you introduce yourself and like Bukaya tell your um, connection to the AC community? Okay, so my name is Elena Gonzalez. I'm currently a junior at Stockton University. I have a literature major with a concentration in secondary education. And just like Lukaya, I am a part of the Engelberg Leadership Scholarship Program, and we are part of the first cohort. And ELSP, for short of the program, is an initiative to bring, it's kind of a lot, but basically it's to bring everyone back into the city and kind of build that community atmosphere again through Stockton University being placed within the city. So my connection is that I am currently a part of that program. But in addition to that, I am born and raised in Atlantic City, just like Lukaya. And I have also had volunteer experience within my um, community church, which is, which is the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church down near, I think it's um, maybe near the GameStop is how I kind of remember it, but that's where it is for me. And yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your role in Invisible Youth? So I believe my role well, as a physical role would to be is to be a part of the chapter one um, chapter one group, and I feel as though my secondary role was kind of to be a perspective of the Gen Z community within the current pandemic and how everything was going. So I was kind of like a reporter, if you will. Okay, awesome. Um, could you share with us a short summary of what you talked about in the article? Yeah, so we talked about a lot because I remember I had her on the line for like a good hour or so. But in short, what we discussed in the article was kind of a lot about the misinformation that was being spread. Because as humans, we really don't like knowing that there's something unknown, which is something I really do stand by. And when there was so much variability up in the air and a lot of um, unknownness around, it was just very anxious. It was a very anxiety provoking situation and a lot of people were anxious. So um, we kind of discussed, you know, how I went on the boardwalk as well, maybe a couple months afterwards it, in late May. And I finally had like my first outing into like the city because I was just so scared to go. So we talked about the misinformation that everyone was receiving, why they were scared and how the whole, in my perspective, how the whole COVID-19 pandemic went was that in March and April, when everyone was really terrified of what was going on, and everyone had a lot of misinformation, the awareness and the anxiety was at like a level 10. But then slowly as the months progressed and we were able to obtain a lot of information about the situation at hand, we all kind of slowed down. So in essence, that's what our little segment talked about. Awesome. Um, what has been your experience specifically as a student during this pandemic and how has it affected you and your education? So being a student during this pandemic is a little bittersweet. There are some negative aspects of it being that for me I really do prefer a traditional classroom setting and as someone who's going to as someone who's going into education wanting to be a teacher I really do prefer that sort of setting so being remote and being virtual it was very different but not impossible so that kind of affected me in the ways of which I was communicating with my peers with my professors with my scholarship activities and things like that um, on the better side it really challenged me in a good way to kind of be adaptable in certain situations. And another really great positive thing was that my intern, I had an internship as well with the Stockton University's Goals Gear Up program, which in short is a college readiness program for Atlantic City and Pleasantville students. That, was a, that program was able to be changed into remote setting. So I was able to conduct that um, internship entirely from home. So if I hadn't had that experience, I think my confidence in my future career endeavors would have been very different than it is now. But I think with the pandemic itself, it comes a little good and bad and it's just trying to find that balancing act in between. 
Right, I completely agree with you. Um, one of the key words you said was adaptability. I think that's something that we've all had to learn, um, mm -hmm. which is probably something good for us. You know, we kind of get stuck in our ways at times. Um, so I think personally, every now and then, it's kind of good to shake things up. <laughs> And, you know, it just makes you more versatile. I'm sure we'll all have a lot more versatility after this and what we can do. Um, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to toss this question back to Akaya. But first, I'd like to interject with a thought. As we know, COVID-19 is not the only pandemic that has plagued our country recently. We've been experiencing, unfortunately, once again, social injustices and police brutality toward Black people very overtly. We're living in a very pivotal time in history for multiple reasons. So with that being said, Lukaya, what has been your, ex your experience as a student during this pandemic, but even more specifically as a Black student? Well, um, unfortunately, this is a subject and situation that I'm, I'm too familiar with. Like the feelings, that, uh, the feelings of sadness and frustration that really came up after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's sudden deaths they were really difficult to process at first, especially while trying to find a role within uh, Black Lives Matter, within the movement. So the conversation that like Yamira and I had for chapter two really helped affirm and validate my feelings towards the social injustices that have happened both recently and in the past. Mm, thank you. I um, mean, I know you just touched on chapter two, but I was going to ask you, <laughs> what can we expect from chapter two? We know um, chapter one has already been published on the website. So when you get a chance, please go view that under our stories tab. Um, but what can we expect for chapter two? Well, chapter two of Invisible Youth will be a little different from chapter one. While chapter one focused mainly on the pandemic around COVID-19 itself, Chapter two will include discussion about elections, the Black Lives Matter movement, and uh, hopefully a little more. Uh, we wanted to focus on the situations running parallel to COVID-19 because it's so interesting to see like how much of a domino effect it's having on everything. So I can't wait for everyone to meet the participants uh, through this chapter. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you both so much for joining us today and give us an, um, giving us some insight into your project. It is much appreciated. We're excited for chapter two to be published. Um, so audience members, please look forward to chapter two being published. I believe it's gonna be published this week. Um, and thank you again for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you again for this opportunity. Of course. Thank you as well. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to move along and talk about another project that we have going on. So our story bank. This one is exciting to me. <laughs> um, I love this concept. So recently, we just launched our story bank officially. The bank serves as a collector of stories, and the aim is to gather, preserve, and archive stories surrounding Atlantic City um, and its community. Story banks live on our website, as you can see on the slide. Um, it instructs you where to go. And there is a drop down list with subtabs, and each theme, um, each bank, excuse me, has a theme of its own. So, as you can see, we have a theme of COVID 19, of the uprisings, at the, um, of the elections, and then we have a monthly theme, which is a theme that we switch out uh, monthly. And this month, it is based on faith. The cool thing about these story prompts is that not only are you guided in writing your story, but you're also permitted to upload other elements such as pictures, video, and audio. Um, it's also good to know, as a sidebar, <laughs> that your story will never be shared without your permission. Once you submit your content, it'll be pri privately stored in an archive. Should a media partner or a content creator be interested in doing a piece on your story, you'll first be contacted. So I'll just give you a second to kind of look at what the setup is. Um, once you click on one of these tabs on the website, it'll take you to a survey. Um, and that's where you'll input all of your information. So please, when you have a moment, go and check that out. We really want to hear your stories. Um, they are of interest to us. And I believe Toby is dropping something else in the chat. But like I said, if you go right to our main page on the website and go under the stories tab, you'll find all that information. Um, let me see how we are on time. All right, I think I can briefly go over. <laughs> I'll share my screen again. Some of the things that we have done recently. 
within the past few months. So I'll talk about some of our story circles. Our story circles is um, our main type of event. This is an event that we like to do. It's a time in which we share stories with the community um, and collect those stories. Of course, with the pandemic, we haven't been able to do them in person, so we've been doing them virtually. Um, so just a quick overview of each of these events. On March 27th, we hosted a story circle with the theme of resilience. We asked our participants to tell us a story about a time in which they overcame hardship in their personal life and shared stories of strength. On June 18th, in response to the senseless deaths linked to police brutality and racism, we decided to host our first Juneteenth story circle as a way to celebrate culture, but also educate individuals on a very important day in American history. We were joined by Dr. Kamika Murphy, who's an assistant professor of Atlantic Studies at Sasa University. She kicked off the event with a brief oration about the history and significance of Juneteenth, as well as her own personal reflections. Our participants then shared stories of independence. Some recurring themes that seemed to trend throughout the night included education, spirituality, unlearning, leaving, returning, rebirth, and transition. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, on July 16th, we hosted our Faith Story Circle. So this event was connected to a community-driven panel discussion we held in collaboration with Mosaic, a community of sacred partners, and the Press of Atlantic City on June 25th. The event entitled, entitled Faith Forum consisted of a very diverse panel of local clergy and their considerations on spirituality and hope during challenging times. This Video content and article was then published on Press of AC's website. Our Faithful Forum Story Circle gave community members a chance to consider the same. Reverend Latasha Milton, senior pastor of Asbury United Methodist Church, led the group with opening remarks and left us with plenty of gems to take along with us. Uh, we shared stories about coping and adversity and relying on hope to navigate through circumstances. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap that up. I know our time is basically up. I just wanted to give you some things to look forward to. So this is our last slide. I'm going to leave this up as I talk just so you have some time to jot down um, how to connect with us via social media and our website. Um, and I'll just kind of talk over that. So as I turn to the final page of our evening and share with you my last slide, um, I'd like to give you a brief overview of things to look forward to in the near future. We'll soon be hosting a back to school event, even though we don't know what that looks like. <laughs> but um, we'll be hosting that with the leadership studio in Atlantic City. Um, and I think this is a good time to do it because it will marry the concepts of wellness and storytelling, which I'm sure we'll all need a bit more wellness <laughs> come, come fall. Furthermore, some of our continued programming will include intergenerational projects with youth and elders in the community, content surrounding the uprising. COVID-19 pandemic and upcoming elections, and more ways in which we'll be engaging with you, our community. So, hope you all had enough time to get that. I'm going to take that down just so we can talk to you one more time and give our words of gratitude. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. I hope that our presentation this evening allowed you to see the power of narrative and the importance of this work. We have so many plans in store that we're excited about for this project and we hope to be able to continue our story with you. As our program ends, I'd like to share a quote with you. As Sue Monk Kidd so eloquently put it, truth is in order to heal, we need to tell our stories and have them witnessed. The story itself becomes a vessel that holds us up, that sustains and that allows us to order our jumbled experiences into meaning. If we haven't been living in jumbled experiences <laughs> these past few months, I don't know. Um, I hope that you're empowered to share your story for it may just be the catalyst for change or the link for connection that we need. Be sure to add your story to the story bank, please. We need those stories. We love to, um, to hear about these stories. We really value what you have to say as a community. And I'm just going to talk to Satobi to see if there's any more words she would like to offer before we leave this evening. Hi, everyone. Again, just wanted to say thank you for joining us. Christina, this was fabulous taking us through this whole story behind the stories of AC. I enjoyed the journey and being part of it. And thank you to 48 Blocks uh, for including us. Uh, we are so grateful and we hope to continue 
uh, collaborating with the community. So please share your experiences with us. Come volunteer, uh, get acquainted with our website, and you can see a few different entry points to come and get involved. So we are delighted to meet you here, and we hope to see you all again soon. So thanks so much for sharing time. Thank you, Toby, and thank you once again, audience. Thank you for the lot, like Toby said. We really appreciate having this platform to be able to share our story with the community. So enjoy your evening and have a good one.